Martin, over here! Marine iguanas. I don't believe it. These are the rafters we're looking for. The marine iguana. Whoa! Like a chunk of rock. They're really well camouflaged in this stuff. Oh, fantastic. Look at them, they are cool. Yeah. This shortened face is almost round heads. Barnacle-like projections on the top of their forehead. Classic iguana spines down the back. And hundreds of them. But the ancestors of these reptiles were lush vegetation-eating iguanas. So what did they find to eat here? And where did they find it? As soon as the sun came out, we were going to find out. They're a cold-blooded reptile, so they need the heat of the sun to warm them to active mode. One by one, they move towards the sea. That is where their ancestors went to tap into one of the only available resources. It's their solution to survival in the Galapagos. They've heated up now, and that's critical because the cold ocean water can strip heat from the body very quickly. These reptiles will be under a time limit from the moment they hit the water. The large is picking up. The big ones are moving. Like an army to the sea. This is where they belong, on the edge of land and sea. It's tough to become a master of both environments. But thanks to ancestors who were true survivors, you are looking at the only sea-going lizard in the world. And now with water temperatures at 61 degrees Fahrenheit, the marine iguana's mission is to find food fast. That's a lot of cold swimming for these lizards. Back on shore, the iguanas were hitting the lava rocks and warming up. It looks like they're part of the rocks. They blend right in, don't they? Oh! <laughs> you see that? He salted me! <laughs> these iguanas are experts at getting rid of salt from their bodies. Because when they're grazing, they're ingesting a lot of salt water. That salt, oh, another one, they got me too. <laughs> and so, to get rid of all the salt water they're ingesting, they collect the salt and excrete it out of their nostrils. And a big sneeze, a marine iguana sneeze. In order to be successful as a species, these castaways had to find a way to reproduce. And these marine iguanas are doing just fine. Considering the fact that they could be an easy target for their predators. The main predator being the Galapagos hawk. The Galapagos hawk is the only resident hawk out here. And if they're not wary, a Galapagos hawk will swoop down and just pick one off. But the young have a defense. They never stray too far from the crevices that offer protection. All right, looks like the danger has passed. Now the young iguanas are the hungry ones. The marine iguanas were absolutely fascinating, but there were more survivors out here. It was time to move on. Direction. Another branch of the iguana bloodline headed inland, making its life in the arid zone of the island's interior. Let's see if we can find some land iguanas. Yes, our first land iguana. Right here by one of its favorite foods, the Opuntia cactus, the prickly pear. Huge mouthfuls, he just presses down on the pad with his foot and rips it off with the strength of his neck. The problem with eating this prickly pear cactus pads is obviously the spines. They are sharp and there are many of them. 
a land iguana has a special way of rolling these cactus pads on the ground and removing the spines. And then they can just munch on the pad. They do sometimes get these spines caught in their lips and in their gums, but it doesn't seem to bother them very much. Reptiles are tough, a lot tougher than we are. The best place to look for the wind rider was way up on the island's plateau. Once just an outcropping of volcanic rock, this island was now full of life. Amazingly, it was these birds, these flyers, their droppings, their cadavers, and natural erosion of the rock that helped to create the soil base for all the Galapagos Islands. At the top of the plateau. Wow. A lot of boobies. Boobies everywhere. The white and black boobies you see right here, these are Nazca boobies. Oh, there's one with some eggs. And they have lots of blood vessels there in their feet. That's what keeps them warm. The Nazca boobies like the ground. The red-footed boobies need the trees. They are tree nesters. They have those flexible webbed feet to grip onto the branch of the tree. But where is this bloodthirsty enemy? Here it is. There's a finch. It's approaching that booby. That right there is the vampire finch. Another, oh, rests right on the tail feathers of the booby and goes in for the attack right at the base of the tail feathers. Most people believe that these birds started out picking ticks off the boobies, little parasites. And with their sharp beaks, they ended up puncturing the skin, getting a little blood out, and that began the vampire behavior. The finches realized that they could get nutrients from the blood of the boobies. Vampire finch are relentless. And the chicks can't get away. There's a finch right there eating maggots from the chick carcass. When you're a castaway, you have to take advantage of every opportunity for food. These little predators are hitting the boobies from every angle. They're drinking the blood of the adults. They are feeding on the carcasses of the young, and they are even attacking the unhatched. They've got into an egg. Oh, and they're descending on the egg, broke through the shell. They're making quick work of this egg. In just a few minutes, the last bird is eating the last of the yolk and shell. These boobies are the lifeblood of the vampire fish. When you're a creature cast on an island and forced to survive, it's amazing the solutions evolution can come up with. Check these guys out. These tortoises, they don't have teeth, but what they do have is a really sharp beak. A lot like a parrot or other type of bird, that beak can snip, snip through the toughest of vegetation. Oh, a familiar flycatcher. A familiar flycatcher right above him. I don't believe it. Wow, a beautiful familiar flycatcher and a massive Galapagos tortoise. This is the spot to be. Oh, he's on the back. He's on the back shell. The flycatcher is waiting for insects that are scared out of the grass by the tortoise's footsteps. A beautiful wind rider and a gigantic floater brought together by chance and now interacting. Look at this big boy. He's coming down the hill and he's looking around probably to make sure that he's the most dominant tortoise in this feeding spot. Those legs remind me of elephant legs, especially the hind legs. He 
fills up his mouth and his throat and has to force the water up to get it into his body. They can store up to four quarts of water at a time. This is a creature who really knows how to fill up the tank. Looks like he's found a good feeding spot. He'll be here for a while. Wow, the giant Galapagos turtle. They don't get bigger than him. Oh, he's great. 